One year ago, thousands of Lebanese were protesting right here, toppling the government, forcing the Prime Minister Saad Hariri to resign. A year later, Saad Hariri was named to form a new government. Hello and welcome to a new episode of the West Asia Post, our weekly show where we bring you your weekly dose of stories coming out of the most volatile region in the world. A few nights ago, the symbol of the revolution behind me was burnt by Hariri supporters. The next day, Hariri was named to form a new government. But how did that happen? We tell you more. A year after his government went out of power, Sunni Muslim politician Saad Al Hariri has been named as Lebanon's new prime minister. Hariri will form a new government to tackle the worst crisis since the country's 1975-1990 civil war. The prime minister designate won the backing of majority of parliamentarians in consultations with Aoun. His nomination follows weeks of political wrangling that has delayed a deal on a new government. Hariri was backed by his own future lawmakers, the Shiite Amal Party, Druze politician Wali Jumblat's party, and other small blocs. While the Shiite group Hezbollah said that it was not nominating anyone, but added that it would seek to facilitate the process. Hariri faces major challenges to navigate Lebanon's power-sharing politics. He must now agree on a cabinet that will address a mounting list of woes, including a banking crisis, currency crash, rising poverty, and crippling state debts. In an address, the returning prime minister designate has pledged to form a cabinet of non-politically aligned experts, according to a French initiative to draw Lebanon out of crisis. On the night of October 17, 2019, the anger swept the streets of Lebanon. Protesters were blocking the roads. It was a very rare moment in the history of this country, but it did not last for long. Some people say that this movement was the beginning of a real change for Lebanon, and others say it's just yet another useless move. So what is October 17th movement? How did it all start? Let's take a look at this exclusive ground report from the streets of Beirut. For the Lebanese, October 17th is a historical day. On this day last year, everyone in Lebanon, every person, every sect, every social class, every citizen on the political spectrum, were screaming with their hearts out on the streets of Beirut and other districts. Down with the system, or killon yani killon. Killun means all of them. Because in Lebanon, the dictatorship is not just one leader. It is the alliance of the sectarian warlord leaders backed up by the symbiotic relationship with the cartels and deep state banking connecting the money to that flawed system. The government back then, that was led by PM Saad Hariri, had issued a decision to tax $6 for WhatsApp. <laughs> Lebanon was furious. People were fed up with the eroding failed system after a continuous life of suffering. As a Lebanese, you have three choices. You either work your way up by belonging to one of the sectarian dictatorships. Or you live the struggle, or you simply immigrate. Lebanese people scattered in diaspora around the world are more than those who live in their country.
October 17th is a great patriotic day for the country. But this fire lasted less than a weekend. Sooner rather than later, the smart intelligence, the biased media, and the living religious-based sectarian political divisions started to resurface. The Lebanese people failed to stay united. Hezbollah, a resistance figure for the Shia. Mentioning the disarming of Hezbollah in the protests first took away half of the people's support. Then, some Hezbollah supporters came back and did this. Then, some NGOs backed by the American and the European embassies took away another part of the support. Then, the warlords themselves, who hijacked the October 17th movement, made it obvious that the politicians once again were able to kill the spirit. But nothing changed in Lebanon. The currency continued to collapse. The new government couldn't really change anything. And then the Beirut port explosion once again called for the anger. this time forcing PM Diab to resign. لذلك أعلن اليوم استقالة هذه الحكومة. Today, as we say these words, Lebanon awaits a new government formed by the same parties using the same ways. But for some people, the revolution against the system still goes on. The man behind me is a protester, by the way. Next in line, we have a very controversial political activist in an exclusive interview. A woman, a wife, a mother of two, and a Shiite lady with a veil that remained in the streets and never lost hope. One of the main voices of the revolution against the banks that still goes on in the streets of Beirut. We listen together to an exclusive interview with Sahar Ghaddad. October 17, and few days after October 17, when the general secre the secretary general of Hezbollah, Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah, asked his people and the people who support the resistance to withdraw the streets and the squares and go out from the protests, it was really a challenge for us, the people who support the resistance against Israel and all the resistant movements in the country, to stay and be the model, the national model, with the honest voices in the streets. Especially after, when October 17th, 17th starts to turn as a March 14 movement. For those who doesn't know what, what, what is March 14, it's the movement, the political movement, opposing Hezbollah's movement. Uh, from here, we can say that a year after or no, no, before of that, I was one of the first people who just adopted the down, down the rule of the bank slogan. This is because Lebanon and the deep state of Lebanon is based on the banks and the bankers. From here, people were at the first point were, were just against us, against that protest in front of the central bank. And to mention, whenever you try to go and protest in front of the central bank, you will find excessive amount of uh, security forces waiting for you. you. No one can dare to go and say for the banks no or down, down the role of the bank. From here and after October 17, after the banks confiscated the, de the depositors' money, seized it and banned people from withdrawing their, uh, their dollars from, from their accounts. Plus, they forced people to withdraw strictly their deposits in Lebanese lira in a range, in a very low range in, uh, against the U.S. dollar. Okay? From here we can say, 
after October 17, uh, the, the image was very clear for people. All people just support our uh, protest in front of the central bank. The media coverage in front of the central bank was, at the first day, I, I think it's zero. There was no media coverage. While we forced the media to come and to, to cover our protest in front of the central bank, to mention why, most of the Lebanese uh, media channel uh, or media platforms uh, get benefits from the banks and the central bank, either from uh, loans or sponsorship. A year later, uh, we didn't lose hope. We will not lose hope. This is a single round in front of this authority. We cannot lose hope. We have no choice either just to go and, and stay in their, in their, uh, as in their parties and political parties and to be one of their people or to stay in the streets. We will not lose hope. We know that October 17 still housed um, an honest voices and we believe in honest voices and we believe that these honest voices will do the change. And as I always say, this is our country and we will take it back. Well, that's all for Lebanon on this episode, but we have many stories lined up for you from all around West Asia. Before we tell you more, let's take a look at the headlines that we are tracking across the region. The United States has sanctioned five Iranian groups, including the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, for attempting to interfere in the upcoming November 3rd presidential election. Tehran has denied Washington's claims on interference. Jordan reports record new daily coronavirus cases, witnessing a massive surge since the start of the pandemic. The West Asian nation now faces a major outbreak with a tripling of deaths in the last two weeks. Lebanese artists create a statue of a lady by using rubble from the Beirut port explosion. The sculpture includes a clock stopping at the moment of the explosion at about 6.08 p.m. on August 4, 2020. The Israeli military launched overnight strikes in the Gaza Strip after two rockets were fired towards southern Israel. There have been no reports of casualties or major damage on either side. Israel recently approved more than 1,300 new settler homes in the West Bank, pressing forward with its plans to build illegal settlements in the region. Ironically, this comes only months after Israel promised to put its annexation plans on hold in exchange with the U.S. broke deal of normalization with the UAE and the Bahrain. This is the West Bank, a chunk of land located on the West Bank of River Jordan and surrounded by Israel on all sides. While it was occupied by Israel in the 1967 war, Palestinians claim all of the West Bank as part of a future independent state. But of the three million people living out here, Many are Jewish Israeli citizens. The Israelis living out here are called settlers. They live in the West Bank but are citizens of Israel. These settlements enjoy widespread backing among Israelis many of whom view them as religious, national or strategic necessity. Israel cites historical and biblical links to the region. And many Jews look at it as an integral part of the biblical land of Israel. Over 460,000 Israeli settlers reside in the occupied West Bank. There are around 130 officially recognized settlements. Scattered across the West Bank, the largest are home to thousands of people. 
with apartment complexes, public parks, shopping malls and factories. But not all of those living here moved because of their love for Israel. House prices are often cheaper than in the major cities of Israel. And settlement blocks are connected to the rest of Israel by well-maintained roads. While Israeli authorities maintain these were built on vacant or unused land, Palestinians say the land is often bought from Palestinian owners through middlemen. Most countries view settlements Israel has built in territory captured in the 1967 war as illegal and as an obstacle to peace with the Palestinians. The U.S. brokered normalization deal with the UAE and Bahrain. Israel had promised to put on hold plans to annex divide. parts of the West Bank. Let us put all cynicism aside. But a recent approval for more settlements means that Israel is pushing forward with its plan in the West Bank. According to a new watchdog report, more than 12,000 illegal Israeli settlement homes were approved this year. With Israeli settlement approvals hitting a record high in 2020, Palestinians and neighboring Jordan have condemned the recent approvals. In a joint statement, France, Germany, Britain, Italy and Spain also said that they are deeply concerned about Israeli plans to build new settler homes. But even after international condemnation, the go-ahead could help mute criticism for Benjamin Netanyahu from settler leaders, who are traditional allies of the Israeli Prime Minister. West Asia Bureau, we on World is One. The Kurdish people were once considered allies in the war against ISIS, but it has been a year now since the Turkish offense on the Kurdish regions in Syria. 300,000 displaced. The Kurdish people are now refugees, forced to live in tent-like settlements, but most of them still long for home. Our next report tells you more. The five-month-old paralyzed baby girl of Vadha Sheikh Mus has only lived in a tent. Like thousands of other Kurdish families in Syria, Wada had to abandon her home about a year ago. <laughs> when Turkish-backed forces captured their hometown. In 2019, Ankara launched an offensive against Kurdish forces on its southern border with Syria. Now, over 10,000 Kurds live in camps set up by local Kurdish administrators as refugees within their own country. The 2019 offensive by Turkey on Kurdish land was codenamed Operation Peace Spring. Ironically, it led to the displacement of over 300,000 civilians like Wadha. The UN High Commissioner for Human Rights has warned of growing violence and killings in areas captured by Turkey with desperate need for humanitarian aid. Children living in camps are still unable to go to school and fears of a lost generation linger. One, two years, God knows. What will the future of our children be? How will my daughters spend the rest of their lives in the tent? When they grow up and become aware, what psychological state will they be in? Most homes and belongings left behind have been seized or looted. The displaced Kurds had hopes of returning to their home one day. But their dreams and their future have been snatched away. Uh, 
Life in the Hasake camp is tough. The dusty site is crowded with other Kurdish civilians. For some of them to be buried in a graveyard is better than living in the camp. Life in the camp and life in a graveyard are the same. To be buried in a graveyard is better than to be living in the camp. I always tell myself that if I were dead in Ras Al Ain, it would have been better than living in the camp. In the camp, we die a thousand times a day. Turkey has been accused of ethnic cleansing and European nations have imposed an arms embargo on Ankara. America has been criticized for abandoning the Kurds who helped fight ISIS. While the Russian and Syrian ceasefire with Turkey has done little to help those who had been displaced. The Kurds were once considered an ally against ISIS by the combined task force. But more than a year since the Turkish offensive, they have just become pawns in the international power battle underway in Syria. West Asia Bureau, Vion, World is One. A conventional arms embargo imposed by the UN Security Council on Iran 13 years ago has finally come to an end. From now on, Iran can legally buy and sell conventional weapons. This was hailed as a momentous day for the country, but it is yet to be seen what this will change for Iran globally. Tehran has described the end of UN arms embargo on Iran as a major diplomatic victory against US President Donald Trump's administration. Five years since the Iran nuclear deal went into effect, the United Nations arms embargo on Iran expired October 18th. It is a historic failure for the US that it could not push forward with its intentions in spite of applying deception and unlawful actions in a world that has become multilateral. The Islamic Republic proved once again that America is not the superpower it pretends it is. However, the Trump administration says the UN Security Council has failed in its mission to promote international peace and security by not extending the conventional arms embargo on Iran. One of the reasons that the JCPOA was such an enormous failure is it created a simple pathway for Iran very quickly to generate the fissile material that it needed for a nuclear weapon, right? In a matter of months, they could turn it on and get after it. This, this was one of the central failures of that agreement. In August, the U.S. went to the U.N. Security Council in an attempt to get the ban extended, but the Council refused. Washington's next move was to use a provision in the 2015 nuclear deal that would restore all U.N. sanctions on Iran. The U.S. argues that Iran has violated the very agreement that the U.S. has abandoned two years ago. The rest of the world rejected those arguments and have stood by the Iran nuclear deal, also known as Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. But it is still not clear how many weapons Iran will be able to buy or sell. Russia, however, has signaled that it may be ready to defy the wrath of Washington and sell an advanced missile defense system to Iran. Washington's fight to keep sanctions in place has pitted it against some of its closest allies as the world waits for the results of the November 3rd U.S. presidential election. We will just have to wait and watch to find out if U.S. policy on Iran changes anytime soon. West Asia Bureau, we on. World is one. That's all we have for you on this episode of the West Asia Post. I will see you next week with a brand new lineup, bringing you more stories from the world's most volatile region. Until then, stay home and stay safe. I am Ghadi Francis, and you are watching We On. World is one.